Ann Halter. I work at School of Mines and on behalf of South Dakota Public Broadcasting School of Mines and Hey Camp, we just like to say thank you for coming tonight. This is a collaborative program. We have it every um, third Tuesday of the month and we're just having a lot of fun with this program. We hope you'll come back and visit us again. Tonight we have Mark Bowrun from our mining and uh, management engineering program. He is a 40 year veteran of the mining industry and he's gonna share with us a bit of his knowledge that I happen to find very fascinating about the hang up man. So without further ado, please give him a round of applause to welcome him. Test. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I have a little song for you. Daylight or dark, in rain or shine, it don't much matter down in the mine. For the tunnel's deep, Lord, the air gets thin. That's the way of life for the mining man. His lungs are weak, his back is gone. His 60 years are plainly shown. Lived half his life down in the ground. A cold steel hammer brings a mournful sound. Daylight or dark, it rain or shine. Yes, my name is Mark Bowron, and I am uh, one of the instructors in the mining uh, uh, engineering and management department. And I'm an engineer. And so I figured that somewhere in my contract, it's a requirement that I at least show you one graph. <laughs> this is a graph of mining fatalities uh, from 1915 to 2015. And in 1917, there were 3,679 fatalities in the mining industry in the United States. In the years between 1915 and 1930, there was an, on average, uh, 2,866 each and every year. Uh, that is equal to eight fatalities a day for 15 years. That's unimaginable. It's unconscionable. Uh, also on this graph, you can see mining fatalities dropped off dramatically in 1930. I wish that was a result of, of safety pr procedures, but it wasn't. It was because that was the beginning of the Great Depression. The Mine Safety and Health Act was passed in 1977. Uh, today, the average number of fatalities in the mining business uh, that has nationwide a workforce on the order of about 400 to 500,000 employees. The average annual from 2011 to 2015 is about 38 fatalities a year. That's still too many. But it's still, the, the numbers continue to decline. So, I don't want to leave you with the impression that the mining industry is still dangerous. A quick uh, search on the internet, the Bureau of Labor Statistics for 2009, these are the top 10 most hazardous, dangerous jobs in terms of uh, fatalities and uh, injuries. And I assume, are there any logging or loggers in here? Uh, 
I know that there's probably some farmers and ranchers. Farmers and ranchers is uh, number eight on the list. Mining is not even in the top 10 now. But I worked underground uh, from 1975 to about 1982 at the Climax Mine in Colorado. And I started off there in January of 75, right after I'd gotten out of the service. And I started off as a miner, working underground. Uh, from there, I progressed up. I became uh, the 600 level en engineer. I was an assistant to the uh, chief engineer. I became the 600 level, one of the, excuse me, development shift bosses. Um, production shift boss, and that was my exposure, my first exposure to the position as hang-up man. I supervised hang-up men uh, pulling ore from underground. Uh, from there, uh, I became a development foreman on the 600 level and then went back down, or excuse me, then went up to the stork level uh, and was a production foreman on the stork level. Uh, this is a picture of the mine today. You can see the open pit in the background. You can see the processing facilities in the foreground and Bartlett Mountain in the back. Uh, today only the open pit is operating. The underground has been closed and it's been allowed to flood. Here's a picture from 1935, and uh, shipments began from the mine in uh, 1915. The, uh, at the time, and for the longest period of time, the Climax Mine was the largest uh, molybdenum mine in the world. Uh, and for many years, it supplied more than three quarters of uh, the annual uh, molybdenum supply in the world. This picture from the 1950s shows uh, the company town in the foreground, and you can begin to see the subsidence on the surface uh, <clears throat> from the mining activity. The, uh, the mine is located about 80 miles west of Golden, Colorado. It's on uh, Fremont Pass. Fremont Pass is at 11,300 feet. Uh, the company town was located above that. Uh, and at the time, it was the highest uh, human settlement in the United States. The mean average annual temperature at this location is below freezing. That presents a whole new set of problems trying to operate a mine, particularly a surface mine. Now, at the time, uh, this was, uh, and I only exclusively worked underground there. Uh, so what's molybdenum? It's a, molybdenum, <laughs> not Molly be damned. They called it, they called, sometimes they called it Molly be damned uh, because in the early years they didn't understand, they didn't know what it was. They, people thought it was graphite. It has some of the similar characteristics as gr of graphite, uh, but it's a metal, and it is primarily used in steel alloys, tool steel, armament. Uh, it's also, the, the, you can find, and you'll see, molybdenum grease. Uh, so it's a lubricant. It has similar qualities, but they called it Molly B. Dam because it would gum up the machinery uh, when they were trying to mine other elements. The, this is a picture of German artillery gun called Big Bertha, 1915. This artillery piece had an 18-inch diameter bore and could shoot artillery projectiles 8 to 10 miles. U.S. engineers didn't understand how the Germans had developed this technology uh, and this metallurgy uh, in 1915, and 
Uh, it was as a result of mixing molybdenum to the steel to make it harder. When the United States declared war on Germany in World War I uh, in 1917, they also passed the Treating with the Enemy Act. Now, the Treating with the Enemy Act uh, authorized the seizure or confiscation of any assets in the United States that were owned by uh, Germany and countries that we were at war with. So as a result, the, the American Metals Company was a mi minority stakeholder in the Climax mine, and they were, as a result, in 1917, awarded 100% uh, of the interest in uh, uh, this mine, not only for the war effort in uh, World War I, but also for the war effort in World War II. Executive Order L-208 actually shut down the Homestake mine, and many of the miners, in, in uh, 1941, and many of the miners left the Homestake mine and came to support the war effort and mining of molybdenum during World War II. So much of what I'm going to talk about uh, comes out of this, out of, out of the manuals. I was, uh, the safety production uh, and policy and procedures manuals that uh, uh, were published for the employees at the mine. And I happened to, for some reason, I kept all the mine. And so, uh, pictures, there aren't very many good pictures for, uh, of underground mining operations uh, from the 70s. You know, the lighting's bad, you can't really see. So these, these this production manual uh, is where a lot of these drawings come from. For example, uh, the mine was uh, principally a sub-level induced panel caving or a block caving mining method. Uh, it removes the ore by undercutting the ore body. Uh, and it's very, uh, it's probably one of the most uh, economic extraction methods for underground mining. And then subsequent to that, the, the ore is ground up and using froth flotation, the molybdenum is uh, floated on the top and collected that way. This is a, a, a diagram of the stork level. And each one of these drifts here are the production drifts. And the trains would come in from, from uh, outside and they would circle around and go down the production drifts and then head back out. The, 300 feet below the stork level was uh, the 600 level. And then 300 feet below the 600 level was the 900 level. The 900 foot level never got developed. The mine closed and it's since been flooded. Uh, the 600 level was actually in the process of being developed and there was, uh, there was considerable production uh, from the 600 foot level. Uh, total, uh, Daily production was on the order of about 60,000 tons a day, of which at the peak, uh, about 35,000 of that came from the underground. This is a, uh, a drawing that shows sort of schematically the open pit. Um, some of the levels that, that were mined earlier than uh, the very early history of the mine in, uh, 1915 on, the stork level was here and then the 600 level was 300 feet below that. So just briefly, I wanted to, to talk about some of the conventional drill and blast techniques. T typically, three types of rock drills to use to drill holes uh, in the rock to advance a face round. You can see the miner here is drilling holes, slits the primer stick, inserts a uh, blasting cap, tamps it in the hole, and then, and then it's timed with delays 
blasting caps that are, that are delayed to go off so that the burn holes go off first and then the reliever holes around that go off and then the trim holes around that and then uh, you can see the burn goes first and it begins to open up an opening into the rock the relievers ignite the powder and blast. So these blasts uh, are milliseconds apart. And ultimately, or finally, the back, the trim holes, and then last to go is typically the lifters. The lifters go last because what it does is uh, it, it lifts and levels the muck pile, makes it ready for the, the miner to come back in, scale down, the rock, loose rock, make it safe, and begin to drill again. So that's basically the, the, the uh, primary blasting sequence. But in order to understand what a hang-up man did, you have to understand the uh, responsibilities of the hang-up man in the context of what the mining method was. And so there's basically three levels. There's a haulage drift a slusher drift, which was perpendicular, finger cutouts, and then all of, the, all of this, these levels were all formed and encased in concrete to stabilize it. Uh, very expensive, but uh, very, uh, this mine was very lucrative for many years. Uh, above this level are the funnels or the draw points in which the block caving sequence was started. So that would, be, and, and there was no concrete and there was no support. So above this level, these drifts were driven in order to uh, drill and, and undercut the ore body and, and blast it so that it started the caving process. Looking at it in cross section, here's the haulage level, the slusher drift level perpendicular, the fingers and then the funnels and the the ore actually when this was undercut the ore would cave in and collapse due to its own weight the rocks would grind up as they moved down through the draw points and they would break up and uh, pulverize in order to uh, go through the draw points there's a, a, another close-up uh, of that same drawing. So the ore was transported outside. There was a 30-ton locomotive. These are 10-ton uh, Granby-style cars. There were 26 in, in a string. Uh, and these, these uh, draw holes, these draw points between the slusher drifts were, were spaced such that you could, the loader operators could load the cars at the same time. So there could be two or th three or even perhaps four uh, loaders loading on the car. So the first uh, uh, would get, might get the first four cars and when they, when they were all loaded, they'd hit the buzzer and the locomotive driver would pull forward one car and three or four or five of the slusher operators would fill four or five cars simultaneously until the entire train was filled and then they would um, head outside uh, to the crusher. Uh, the caving process, after the ore was undercut and it began to collapse, uh, it really started from, on. it was primarily the east in from east moving west in the uh, ore body. And so starting with number one here, that would be the, the draw points that would be started first. And you can see this is waste here, and this is depicts ore. And it, moving from east to west, they would draw the ore out until the engineers, they would take samples, the engineers would say, Okay, stop with this draw point because it's no longer economic. It's below cutoff grade. Um, and you can see they, the progression would, be, would move this way. Well, 
This is a, a picture of, uh, actually, now you can see that the surface subsidence as this ore collapsed inside the mountain and moved down to these draw points, you can see the surface subsidence here. And this is a drawing that actually is uh, much later, probably from the 70s. Uh, and there was a hard core, right, the, the so-called hole in the donut, uh, uh, in the middle that, where there was no ore. So what did the hang-up man do? It was his job. Well, let me, first of all, let me, let me go back a little more detail. This is one of the slusher drifts or production drifts. This is the bottom is the haulage. The next one up is the slusher. And there was a 200 horsepower electric motor in here. Uh, there were six fingers, three on each side. And th those were the draw points. Uh, and there was a dipper, uh, it was a folding dipper and had a folding blade on it. So when you pulled it back, you could pull it up over the ore coming in, in through the fingers. But when you pulled it forward, the, the dipper went down and you would actually move that towards the draw hole and it would dump the ore into the uh, uh, car below. Looking at the engineering drawing and of this in cross section, these. These draw points were approximately eight by seven feet in diameter, and you could stand up in there. And the, it was the hang-up man's job to blast any uh, ore or rocks that wouldn't fit through that opening. And this was by design. You did not, they did not want any rocks larger than that to come through that opening. They wanted the blasting to occur outside of the concrete because if, if the opening was larger, then uh, it would, wouldn't fit through the draw hole or it would, it would uh, block the ore car down below and that caused all kinds of subsequent blasting problems, having to break up a, a big rock that was in the ore car uh, uh, among all the other utilities with the air and water and the electric lines and everything. So you wanted this secondary blasting and the hang-up man up here. But the hang-up man, when that occurred, had to go up this. Now this is a 45 degree angle uh, and it's concrete all the way around. And then above this, this is all barren rock, unsupported. This, I, should, I should point out that Th that this 45 degree angle is approximately the angle of repose of the ore, of the broken ore. A, a rock unsupported here will not stay there. It will run down to the bottom. So the technique and the procedure was the hang-up man had, uh, would place explosive charges, and we call these bombs. Uh, there were six bombs to a case of dynamite, and it was 40% dynamite. The, uh, there were, so each bomb, and a case of dynamite weighs 50 pounds. Each bomb was eight and one third pounds, and it was, it was roughly a little bit larger than like a brown paper lunch bag, and it had, and it was typically plastic lined, uh, uh, or, or sometimes it was wax paper. And there was a little cut or an opening uh, in the bottom. And, and you would stick these uh, uh, bomb sticks. These are loading sticks or bomb sticks. They were uh, 20 feet long, one by two inch clear uh, pine. And you'd stick that bomb on there and you'd you know, stick it up against a rock. And you tied this in with deck cord or primacord. Some people call it E-cord. Uh, it's exploding uh, explosive cord. And you didn't have to tie every one of them in. You could just place the, uh, the dynamite one bag next to the other bag and it would all go off. Uh, and you tried to get in and wedge these bombs in between uh, rocks and not wedge it up against the the concrete, because you didn't want to break the concrete, so you, you try to put it against the rock. And, and what this uh, drawing is showing, uh, this is from the safety manual, where 
Do you, do you think this doesn't look safe? <laughs> is, that why you're, is that why you're laughing? Uh, this would be a new hire. <laughs> this would be the hangout man. And uh, this would be the detonating cord. And then you tied in the detonating cord to a blasting cap that had a, uh, about a minimum length of 49 inches of safety fuse. And then you would ignite the safety fuse with what was called a pull wire spitter. This, this spitter was a little cardboard thing and had a little handle on it. And when you pulled on it, it would shoot flame out and would ignite the, um, the safety fuse, and the safety fuse would burn, ignite the, uh, the blasting cap, the blasting cap would uh, uh, ignite the debt cord, and that would set off the explosion, explosives. So the old hang-up man, first of all, he would never tie it in. He would never connect it while he was up there, and he would never leave the new hire down there below <laughs> uh, to I uh, wonder what was, you know, what does this wire do? Uh, so the hang-up man position was the highest paid uh, non-salaried or hourly uh, employee at the mine. Uh, in most cases, the, the seasoned, experienced uh, hang-up men made more money than their immediate supervisors. Uh, as I recall, they made somewhere, on, and this is in 1975, somewhere on the order of about $20 an hour. So looking at inflation, projecting that forward, that would be about $95 an hour today, which would be for a normal 40-hour work week, 52 weeks out of the year, that would be about $195,000 a year. Now, I don't think wages have kept up with inflation. I don't think, uh, because for multiple, many reasons, uh, which I, I won't go into in, in this discussion, but these kinds of things interest me because I teach mental economics. But the equivalent of 190, in purchasing power, $195,000 a year to a laborer uh, underground. But there's trade-offs. Make a lot of money, you take more risk. The hang-up man supervised uh, the loader operators, the slusher operators, uh, and, and there was always training going on and safety. Uh, the, um, and, but the, the, the loader operators, those were the people that ran the slushers that filled the work cars. Uh, they had to work under the supervision of the hang-up man and they were not allowed to sh go up into the finger and shoot hang-ups. They had to stay on the slusher level floor. The, uh, you know, this is one of the uh, uh, drawings out of the safety manual. Rocks may, you know, you, you might be up here putting a shot up in, the, in a, a hang up, but if it was open above, you had to watch out for that. Uh, I remember one time I was up there and your cap lamp is, is only good for about 50 feet maybe and I took my light off and I shined it up and I shined it straight up in the cave. I could not see the back. That's how far up. And, and if a rock comes out of there uh, and it hits you, you're done. Uh, yeah. Very dangerous. And, and you didn't want to spend much time up here. Uh, uh, you get in and get out, get the job done. You know, the other things to watch out for was if there was a hole, the big rock was blocking the hang up, but there was a hole, or, could, or, or smaller rocks could still come spitting out of that hole and cause an injury. Uh, another method uh, or occurrence was there might be loose muck here and the big rocks would be uh, held up by that. And what you could do is you could take a loading stick and you could, you could sort of erode this and get this, uh, remove the support here and that would cave in. 
uh, or you could actually even uh, use a water hose and, and spray that up in there. And the loader operators were allowed to do that. Uh, spray the, uh, and wash the loose muck out from underneath the bigger rocks and then the ore would begin to flow again. One of the requirements, uh, safety requirements, that two pe if, there were, if you were poking in or washing up, hang up in, you had to have two people in the drift uh, for safety reasons. Uh, another potential hang up, uh, type of hang up was where the rock had blocked the, and, and it was taking uh, lots of weight from up above, from the ore above it, and it began to spall off. Uh, and so you had to watch out for these or if, if it was beginning to crack or check, uh, the rock could break at any time in the su supporting weight. Or even if there was a void above the hang up and, and a rock fell and it hit this, it could cause the hang up to come in prematurely. Um, fractured hang ups. So th there's a couple of, of uh, things that are, are important here. Um, I guess the first one from a safety perspective is that no hang up was safe. You never trusted any hang up. But also, has anybody ever heard about Tommy knockers? Tommy knockers, and I'm not talking about the beer. Uh, Tommy knockers is are the the, the mythical miners that uh, were uh, was a belief by the Cornish miners that came and immigrated to the country around the turn of the century, uh, and they believed that uh, these Tommy knockers were lived underground. They were about two feet tall, about, they were greenish in appearance, and uh, they, uh, they were both omens of good luck and bad luck. And then depending upon what the belief was, that there was a certain level of malevolence of the, the Tommyknockers, uh, that sometimes they would just steal your tools or hide your tools, or sometimes they would just uh, take something out of your lunchbox underground. Now usually it was the guy, it was your work partner that, that went into your lunchbox and, and stole your pie. But, um, but the important thing here was um, when the miners heard the, and the, the rock and the rock would talk to you and it would creak and groan and pop and, and uh, people attributed that, some people attributed that to the Tommy knockers. I attribute it to the rock was moving. <laughs> and uh, uh, some people believe that, that it, it was actually uh, the, the harbinger of some, something bad was going to happen, or the Tommy knockers were being good and they were warning you to be, on, be aware that the rock was moving. Uh, the attributes of a successful, and by successful, hang-up man, I mean one that didn't die, uh, well, you know, one a uh, hang-up man that, that uh, did it for many years without getting injured, uh, were hearing was essential. Now, some of my students would say, uh, you know, well, you couldn't have been a hang-up man because you can't hear, and they say that to me. I used to be able to hear. <laughs> so, uh, but hearing is essential. Uh, the other thing, the hang-up man, the typical characteristic was they were quiet, they were, uh, had a great deal of self-confidence, uh, they were agile, they were coordinated, they could move because you, one, if you were up in a, in a uh, under the uh, cave, uh, you wanted to hear those rocks. You wanted to hear if they were moving. Even the slightest pebble, you could hear that drop, would be an indicator. And I can remember more than once being up at the top of the, of the uh, funnel, uh, at the top of the finger race, and I'd hear a rock just go tink, tink, and psh, I would run down there, get around the corner, just in case a bigger rock came down. The stork level was 
very close to the surface and as a result of the negative pressure on the ventilation, very often the, the, the stopes uh, and the draw points that were close to the surface would suck cold air in. And so sometimes you would get frozen hangups and those could thaw out uh, with changes in ventilation with even body heat, uh, they, was, they were a concern that th those could thaw out. And, but they, you could bring those in, you could blast those down. Particularly dangerous uh, hang-ups or places where the ore had stopped running, perhaps the cave had arched over, uh, but it was spitting, and when I mean spitting, it was, it was dropping rocks periodically you could hear the rocks come in. That meant it was moving, but it wasn't, you know, it might spit for a day, it might spit for a week. Uh, and, and then it was ultimately gonna come in. So in order to speed up the process, uh, we, would, we would put a bomb up there or several bombs up at the top of the finger and, uh, and try and use the concussion of the explosion to bring and start the ore moving again. Always used Primacord. You always brought the Primacord down uh, out of each of the fingers and you ran a trunk line down the center of the slusher drift and you tied them all in and then you put your, your blasting cap uh, at the manway to go down and the last thing that you did was you made that uh, fuse hot and, and then you walked away uh, guarding uh, in all directions. What you didn't want to tie in your uh, prime accord until you were, you'd start from the back moving forward and you didn't want to tie it in until, uh, the very, until you were ready to shoot. Uh, you didn't want that prime accord to, to, to delay you if you were up there. Um, this particular drawing reminded me of, of a, one of the uh, times that I was uh, helping a hang-up man shoot. And uh, I should say that this type of uh, occupation is no longer allowed under uh, IMSHOP laws. You, you are not allowed to work under unsupported ground. Uh, so there was a hang-up like this, but it had some, so almost like a, a, these were big rocks. They were bigger than this room. They were the size of a house, and they had all jumbled up, and there was a chimney of sorts going straight up about 35 feet. And so this was going to be a big shot. Uh, and I use the term shot and blast interchangeably. Uh, we used uh, about 1,000 pounds. We used uh, 20 cases of dynamite. The least experienced hands were, were down on the bottom, were down in the slusher drift, and we had stacked all the dynamite up down there. And then the, and the least experienced hand would grab an eight pound bag and he would, he would underhand it, throw it up to the guy at the top, and then the next guy would throw it straight up this chimney we were in to a guy about midpoint, and, the, and, and we did this daisy chain, and he would, the guy in the middle would underhand it up to me, and I was at the top, and then I would take it and throw it over to the hang-up hang man who was setting the charge. And, I mean, we're talking rocks as big as this building. Um, and 120 uh, bags of explosives, we did that. Uh, the hang-up man is quite experienced. He, has anybody ever heard of the term a shaped charge? He actually built a pyramid with these bombs and started with a circle and started stacking them up in a pyramid. And at the very top one, he tied that into the prime accord. And what, what a shaped charge does is by, its, by sh the shape, it focuses the energy as it blasts and the blast goes down into the rock. And we, uh, we set that charge, we didn't do that one at lunchtime, we set that one off, uh, uh, at going off shift, and uh, uh, 1,000 pounds of dynamite. I was probably standing 500 feet away, and, but being underground, it's fairly confined space, and it didn't make a sound, it didn't make any noise. What it did was, it, I just felt this, it was like an air blast, it just went, 
and knocked me back a couple of steps. That draw point ran for weeks uh, <laughs> after that. So, yes. Because the blast was confined uh, up in the cave where the rock was already broken, and it, the blast went up there, and, and it was really an air blast is what I was feeling. Now, the air blast was either from the explosives or very often in block caving mines, you'll get what's called an air blast as when the cave st lets loose and drops down, that air's got to go somewhere, and usually it forces it through into the workings. And there have been instances, particularly in Australia, where air blasts have killed numerous miners when, when the entire ore body drops down and that air has nowhere to go. Uh, so was it an air blast? Was it the explosive blast? Uh, I don't know, but it didn't make it. You know, it was this muffled mm, That's all it was. Uh, when, you, when you, we set off explosives, usually, you know, we might blast these are, these are representative of the slusher drifts. And you might set off two or three at a time, and we'd set those off and then go to lunch and let the, uh, you eat lunch while the ventilation evacuated the noxious fumes, come back after lunch and start loading the, car, the trains again. Um, but you had to guard, and you had to have enough people to guard all of the entrances uh, possible interests into that area. Well, typically it was only one end of the drift or the other, and the drift was about a thousand feet long. But it was very important. One of the safety rules was that anybody coming into the area, the hang-up man was in charge, and anybody coming into the area had to notify that hang-up man that they were in the drift. You might get engineers, you might get uh, uh, people taking samples, people doing, uh, taking stress strain gauges on some of the concrete had any number of people, that, but they had to notify that hang-up man that they were in the drift. Even the mine manager, he came underground, he had to notify the hang-up man for safety reasons. Again, this uh, making the, the safety fuse safety rule was had to be a minimum of 49 inches. Well, the safety fuse burned at 40 seconds per foot. So roughly uh, you had about, uh, that was the minimum length of the safety fuse you could use was uh, 49 inches. And you had roughly two and a half minutes uh, after you spit the, uh, the safety fuse in order to ignite the blast. The big blast that I talked about, I think we had a good, uh, you know, 10 feet on that one. It allowed us plenty of time to get far away. So, 1973, Climax had allowed the first women to work underground. 1974, there were 40 women working underground. Generally, the because they only started working uh, underground in the, in the mid-70s, they didn't have enough seniority in order to be hang-up men. I never did uh, know or I don't recall any woman being a hang-up man. Not that they're not qualified, it's just that they didn't have the, uh, uh, the seniority to, to bid for one of the uh, high, highest paying positions. But they did work on the production crew. And generally, in my experience, uh, in my anecdotal experiences, the women were better slusher operators than the men. They, uh, they took better care of the equipment. They were, uh, they were more precise. Uh, they, they didn't try and uh, you know, uh, force anything. They had better coordination in terms of loading these cars because one of the worst things, you get a new slusher operator and it was usually the, 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 you know, the dumb kid, male kid, that would 
not time it correctly and load the ore in between the cars, and then the car, and they, when the locomotive uh, motor driver pulled forward, the car would come off the track, and then the hang-up man would scream, and, and uh, it was a mess. Trying to he'd make him shovel it back in the car and shovel it off the tracks, and and uh, uh, had to split the train and put the car back on the track. That was a problem. Um, Climax had the first female supervisor in 1975 working underground, which was uh, unusual, having women supervising men, and particularly underground. Uh, but also, they had the dubious distinction of having the first female fatality in 1976. The woman was working, she was a, a um, uh, slusher operator, she was a loader, working on a, uh, uh, a production crew and got buried by a run of war in one of the fingers. Uh, in 1979, there were five underground miners uh, killed at one time. Uh, excuse me. In the year, there were five. Three at one time, uh, one of which was an, a woman in 1979. Uh, it was a premature explosion, if you can, if you can read this. Uh, 100 to uh, 150 pounds, so that would be three cases of dynamite uh, prematurely exploded. They never did, they did an investigation. They never conclusively determined what the cause was. Uh, typically, you could you could take a hammer, you could hit a hit a stick of dynamite, you could hit one of these bags of dynamite, you could hit. It's not recommended, but you could hit the the prime accord and it wouldn't go off. Uh, it needed, the, you know, the prime accord needs the combination of the heat and the impact of the blasting cap. Uh, so they never did figure out what caused this particular premature explosion uh, that killed three people at one time. Uh, this, as a result of that, this was a, uh, a drawing from the uh, safety uh, manual you know, don't throw the dynamite on the ground, <laughs> okay, but uh, and I, sh I showed this one before, but sometimes what would happen is you'd get your shot up and everything be ready, to, you wouldn't have it tied in because you would do that very last, but you wouldn't have a blasting cap on it, but you'd have it all ready and then all of a sudden the hang up would let go and it would just sweep down and take all the dynamite, blasting uh, uh, the debt cord, and just destroy it, break the bags open and everything. So what we, when that happened, if that happened, we would just collect up the, the debt cord and we would then try and, uh, we didn't try and salvage it, we just blew it up in another shot because we, you couldn't trust it after that. And then uh, these bags of, uh, paper bags of uh, dynamite would just be all scattered and broken up in the muck pile. Just Put it in the ore car, send it to the crusher. Well, they didn't particularly like that. <laughs> the, the, uh, there, was a, there, there was one time, and I think it was, there was an explosion in the crusher, and I think that it was simply a blasting cap that went off in the crusher. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, the dynamite, uh, unconfined like that, uh, scattered throughout the muck pile would go on. Uh, but I do recall they were pretty unhappy about that blasting cap in the muck in the crusher. So what's the bottom line here? The emotional toll on of this occupation, uh, this ever-present risk of serious injury or fatality or death, uh, it, it had an emotional toll on not only on the workers but also on their families. Uh, there was an instance of uh, one hang-up man basically had a nervous breakdown and never could return to work. I know of another instance where a hang-up man had a close call, uh, nearly got crushed. He, picked, he went down to the lunch uh, room, picked up his lunchbox, 
we called them pie cans. Uh, he picked up his pie can, walked out of the mine, never came back. Uh, family and spouses and friends, you know, th there's this trade-off between this great money, this great paying job in the mountains in Colorado and the ri inherent risk, the daily risk. Uh, so with enough uh, seniorities, many of these hang up men would bid on a surface job, go to the open pit, much less hazardous. They'd, of course, take cut and pay. But it just sort of underscores that there is no old hang up men. So, this, this book was uh, written by a, a fellow, this Stephen Voynich, and this was his story of starting at Climax um, as, a, as a new hire, knowing nothing about mining. He also wrote this book, The History of Colorado's Climates and the Living Room. So the, if, if you want to know more, these two books are excellent. Uh, and I, I took much of the historical information out of this book, some of the, the dates I couldn't remember. And that's Climax today. Um, any questions? Thank you. I have a question? Yes. About how many times a shift or a week would the hang-up man have to put himself at risk? I mean, was it multiple times a shift, or? It, it, it depended on the uh, ore, in particular, zone that they were working in. And uh, every day was a risk. But then there are degrees that some days were worse than others. And um, it, it was particularly risky when they began a new caving operation in a new area of the mine because it would have a tendency to arch over uh, and it was pretty unpredictable. Um, but how many times did they actually, the hang up men, go up into? Uh, Maybe, you know, it's hard, it, hard to estimate, but I would say perhaps maybe once a, once a shift. Um, you know, you tried some of these other measures first, like a concussion shot, uh, you know, using a water hose, uh, maybe going to an adjacent draw point and, and pulling that in order to, you know, relieve the muck on the one next to it. Well, th there was, um, you see, I was, um, there were four sh uh, production shift bosses, and, and they worked shifts, on, and there were four production shift bosses on each level, so there were two levels, and they rotated shifts, and we worked uh, day shift, swing shift, and graveyard shift, and uh, on each uh, with each shift boss, there were probably five hang-up men. Uh, on, so there were at least five hang-up men on each level on each shift. Yes, sir. So, so is the mine is now declined? Well, it's still operating. It, it, the underground is, has been stripped of the steel and is allowed to flood, but the, uh, the open pit is still operational. The, the, the mine, uh, Climax mine is owned by Freeport McMoran, uh, which also owns, uh, they're one of, our, one of the school's largest employers in the mining department, and uh, they also uh, uh, own the Henderson mine, which is also a, a block caving mine in Colorado, molybdenum mine. The, 
in the, in, the, in the Henderson mine, the Henderson mine started production in the 1980s. The Climax mine started production in the 1930s uh, using this block caving method. And the Henderson mine is engineered entirely differently. The draw points are all rubber tired fr front end loaders. Uh, the, 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 they uh, use a different form of blasting to initiate the cave. The, uh, the cave is actually rather than 300 feet, the cave in the Henderson mine is 800 feet. And um, there's even a uh, Australian company that has developed these, uh, what, I don't know if they call them mortar tubes, but they're like a mortar where they s set it underneath the, uh, the hang up and it shoots a mortar up and it explodes when it hits the rock. I don't know if Henderson uses that or not, but uh, th there is that technology. Anybody else? Yes, Dan. Um, probably some variation of it, yes. Oh no, no, no. You, no, you could not uh, 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 under MSHA law. You are not uh, now allowed to work under unsupported ground. By definition, the cave is unsupported ground. It had no rock bolts. It had no timbers or supports or anything. Yeah, Mike. It would be similar to that method that I showed initially as far as the development would be the drill, blast, and muck. And, and I assume, I haven't seen the, 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 the engineering design on that, but I assume that they'll start at the top. They'll mine the entire length on the top and then they'll work their way down. And they'll support the top as they, uh, uh, as they go. They'll support that first with rock bolts and shotcrete and whatever other means, and then they will work their way down knowing that that top is, um, is entirely supported and safe. I haven't, but I haven't seen a design on it. Anybody else? Any other questions? I thank you all. Time for a beer.